or HAP coming from emergency accommodation, while the responsibilities on the landlord to provide the furniture, and etc. If you've been in emergency accommodation for a long period of time, it's obviously very expensive. You have no washing facilities, you have no cooking facilities, and yet people like that are not getting any payment from community welfare when they do maybe finally get a property under RAS or HAP. Um, in relation to people coming in to talk, I had a situation with a, a girl who her rent was put up and for a long time she, ma she made that payment herself and she struggled with it. And when she went into the community welfare to explain the situation, she was told that she potentially was committing fraud because she was paying over her rent allowance limit. So I hate to be negative, but my experience is that community welfare officers are not always understanding and are not always very helpful to people in very difficult circumstances. And unless they either have an elected rep in there with them or somebody from Focus, who they should not have to have, they should not have to rely on that. They should be able to go into the community welfare themselves and make these representations. So I think in relation to training, or what you're saying that uh, you know, notices issued to community welfare offices, there's, a, there's obviously a major, major issue or some issue in communication or people not getting that because my experience, unfortunately, has been an overall negative one in relation to people going in with uh, very difficult circumstances. And that means then that they, they won't go back and they won't uh, speak to you again in relation to it. So I just... I, oh, sorry. I, just if we can get who we can contact when that happens, we can get a point of contact for that because I know you'll give us the facts and figures about how much payment was made, but I think a number of people here would, would agree that their experience is people aren't getting deposits and aren't getting those top-up payments. So who can we, when we come across that, contact or to give you that information? Because there's some breakdown, definitely, because from what you're saying, and I know certainly from my experience, and I imagine others are the same, they're two completely different stories. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Coppinger. Thank you, Chair. Um, my three areas that I'd like to ask you about is the rent supplement, the top of payments and the supports that the department gives to people who are in housing crisis. So the first one's in relation to the rent supplement. Now we've had threshold in here earlier and the rent supplement has remained at nine, I was going to say 19, 13 levels. Um, Freudian slip there. Um, at 20, 13 levels. But it was cut by 28% before that. Now, in Dublin West, and I, I'm glad to see Miss Ty here, um, I know the rents have gone up by €341 Euros per month in two years. So the rent supplement is lagging behind by about €400 Euros probably in, in my area and I'm sure in other people's area. So the rents are at bubble levels, but the rent supplement has gone down. So I just wanted to ask, what responsibility have you for the housing and homeless crisis, given those figures? You've been advising the Minister to keep them at the levels they were. Last year you conducted a review and you said no, leave them at the same level, despite every homeless agency telling you there needed to be an increase. So do you have any responsibility for the fact that people who are swimming against a tide are now becoming homeless because they can't get properties? and they can't stay in them. Um, have you, has the department been using rent supplement as a form of rent control on the backs of the poorest people in this state? That's my question, knowing full well that the rents ha have gone up. The second question is in relation to top of payments. The Focus Ireland, I assume we all agree they're an authoritative agency, said that this is universal. That's the word that Mike Allen used. But yet Joan Burton, the former minister, said there was no evidence, and I quote, no evidence that this was widespread. So is this the only form of social welfare fraud that the department is in denial about? And is it because that the people who are being defrauded are having to defraud themselves that you don't care? Because you use the word fraud, previous TD used it. That's what people are doing by going above the rent limits. They are breaking the department's rules, but you don't care because they're only defrauding themselves. Um, so you're, you're turning a blind eye to that, in my view, with your constant statements. The, the one family organisation, because we all know lone parents are particularly vulnerable right now because of all the cuts that they've had, lone parents, etc. Say that people are paying up to 100 euros a month, plus they're 30 euros a week. 
So what, what level of poverty do you think that that's creating? So my, my third question relates to the general supports for people who are in this housing crisis. In 2014, the EU did a survey and they found 54% of people who were renting in Ireland were in deprivation, as opposed to, say, 5% of owner-occupiers. So we know where the poverty lies. It lies in the private rented sector because of the type of rents that people are paying. Do you think there's an acceptable level of support for people and an acceptable level of social protection for those people? Um, on page four, you, you mentioned the exceptional needs payments for people in emergency accommodation, which I've seen far too many of those people in Dublin West in recent times. Um, you mentioned assisting people with travel costs as one example. But yet, I put in a PQ, a parliamentary question in April to the Department of Education, and they replied, no assessment has been concluded, or sorry, conducted on the school transport needs of homeless children. Was that reply incorrect then? Because you're telling us you're giving money to people who are travelling the length and breadth of Dublin. Um, in many cases, because no hotels take people in Dublin 15, for example, so they're travelling two bus journeys away. But um, I, I don't know of anyone who's told me about getting any help. And can you just finally, is there any extra allowance for food, for example, for families who are living in hotels, given that they've no cooking facilities? And given that they have to go out and buy food continually, could, could you answer that? Um, so just, like, given that there's been a housing and homeless crisis, I see no support extra being given to families. And in fact, you've set your face against increasing the rent allowance, making the situation much worse. Deputy, uh, Deputy Harty. Chairman, uh, my, my question is in relation to rent deposit and rent advance uh, scheme. Uh, Bob Jordan from Threshold said that uh, people in receipt of uh, rent supplement are at a disadvantage when they're competing for uh, uh, accommodation in the private rented area, competing against somebody who has a deposit and a um, month's rent in their hand. Uh, how easy is it for people to get rent deposit and rent in advance so, they, that, so that they can compete at an equal footing? Deputy. Uh, Ms. Faulkner, do you want to okay, yeah. do those and then I'll have a final round of questions? Okay. Um, Deputy uh, Function, I, I'm um, disappointed um, with the, um, the, the views of the, the service that um, the people in Kilkenny are receiving because my understanding was that um, Kilkenny, and yes, there, there are issues, there's about 100 and uh, 28 people in receipt of increased payments in the country. Um, we try to ensure that there's a consistent um, approach right throughout the, the country, but yes, each um, officer would have discretion kind of in their own right. And yes, I suppose they are balancing um, th the need of the customer and also with a need you know, to ensure that there's value for money for the, the taxpayer who are paying um, for these various supplements. Um, in but um, I will take that up um, with, say, the divisional manager in that area and just to have a look um, in relation to some of the payments. Um, in terms of point of contact, um, the department, and we're just going to be reissuing it again to a lot of the new um, deputies throughout the House, we operate a special TD um, inquiry line with direct contact names and email and phone numbers um, for every area of the department, including for each division. So if there's a particular issue, um, to raise it through that fora in, in, the, in the first place. Um, and it depends as well, I suppose, in terms of um, the needs of the, the actual person. Some people do have a deposit available to them, um, others may not, particularly, as you're saying, if they're coming from emergency accommodation. But generally what would happen in those circumstances um, is that the local community welfare officer would be part of the homeless action team in the area, and they would have case conferences around cases of, of people um, coming out to see what their needs are and to try and, and make... The, um, whatever payments are necessary. But again, if there's particular cases that you're aware of, um, we might even have a conversation offline in, in relation to them. Um, people going to um, RAS or HAP um, in relation to furniture, generally it's the responsibility of um, the, the, the landlord's responsibility. Okay. 
accommodation to furniture, I know that, but I'm just saying, if you've been in emergency accommodation for a long time, because what's often been said to people is they should actually be in a position to save, let's say they're living in very overcrowded family circumstances sure. or living in emergency accommodation, they're actually being told by the community welfare officers they should have been in a position to save. They might not be responsible for the furniture in the house, no. but they have obviously, if you're in emergency accommodation, you've had a lot of an ex extra expenses for a long time, and then when they're moving, they have the cost of moving as well, and they're not getting anything at all, any assistance okay. at all. It's, I'm not saying that they, I know that there's no responsibility on the tenant or on the community welfare to pay for furniture in a RAS or HAP scheme, but to acknowledge and recognise that those people will have a lot of extra, just additional expenses in moving, and there doesn't seem to be any flexibility, and, and telling people as well that they should have been in a position to save, you know, it's just, it's not good enough really, to be honest, you know. And ideally, um, each of those cases um, should be assessed on their, their their merits and to see you know, the circumstances of the person coming from emergency accommodation. Um, I'm meeting all of our divisional managers um, tomorrow and again I will raise the concerns of the committee um, so that um, the divisional managers are engaging with the staff as they do um, to see kind of the issues that are coming up and we can, we can raise um, these. Um, the top-ups, um, because we were over the years trying to protect um, the state in a way and ensuring that landlords are declaring the, the, the correct um, payments that are being um, supported through the, the rent supplement scheme. Yes, it, it, it was illegal um, for, for top-ups and this is the, the same point that Deputy Coppinger is making. Um, but unless you know, if the landlord and the tenant are in collusion and it's, it's a cash payment, it is very difficult um, for us to be aware of them. But the clear instructions that have gone out to, to staff is that um, we want to support people. We do not want them to be, to be topping up where it's, it's a vital accommodation need. Um, but I do appreciate that tenants may be afraid or nervous in this situation and we need to try and communicate better um, with um, some of our clients. Um, and as I say, I'll circulate the, the contact list um, to the members of this committee in the first instance, but we'll circulate them um, to all of the um, Oireachtas members. So you have an individual point of contact in the various divisions um, to, to raise issues of concern. Okay. Um, Deputy Coppinger, yes, in terms of um, the, the rent supplement limits and the review, um, yes, I am responsible for the, the, the policy approach in that area. And the main findings of our previous rent review, which we carried out early last year, was that the lack of available supply um, is the main issue there. And it still remains the key issue of the homelessness crisis. Supply across the market in general, and not just in, in the private rented sector. The number of private rented properties is at the lowest levels ever. And increasing rent limits will provide perhaps a small amount of accommodation, um, but that wasn't going to, to solve um, the issues. And that is why last year and um, in the mid-2014, we agreed to the special protocol with Threshold, because at that time we felt that a targeted approach was far more beneficial in terms of um, supporting the individual customers, but also targeting the resources that were available to where they were most at need. Um, the big change, I suppose, that has now happened with the amendments to the Residential Tenancies Act in terms of the rent certainty, so that now um, rents can only be reviewed once every two years as opposed to once every year. Um, so now we will be reviewing the, the rent limits in that, but I suppose in effect we're paying on average um, an extra 120 rental uplifts on a weekly basis. Approximately 23% of the Dublin recipients are already receiving an uplift payment. So in effect the current limits are no longer sustainable and we will be looking at how best um, to implement the commitment in the new programme for government um, to spread, I suppose, the, the increase um, to, to most um, effect. Um, the, the, the measures um, that our department can take in, in a housing crisis um, mainly relate to the financial supports that could be put in place. Um, you queried in terms of, say, the Dublin West and the various um, payments that are being played. 
um, paid. For example, um, uplifts are being made in the Dublin West area, um, and they're on average of about um, €850 Euro is the, the payments that have been made. They're ranging from about €650 Euro up to about £1,100. Um, maybe I might just ask if it's in order, Chair, um, for Rita to maybe just give some of the examples of well, what's actually happening on the ground. Well, uh, the rent limits, uh, you know, in, in Dublin 15, I'm responsible for Dublin 15 rents, rent supplement scheme, and we have approximately 3,000 rents in the area. Uh, live claims, and we are going above the limits in most cases for anybody who comes to us with an increase, a uh, proposed increase from a landlord. And we are going on average about 250 above the limits. Um, obviously, when it becomes unreasonable, we would query it. We might even make a call to the landlord, uh, or they may, may go to threshold where they would ab advocate on their behalf with the landlord. But in general, we are going above the limits under Article 38 for anybody who comes to us with a problem, um, because the last thing we want is for them to be homeless. So, per, you know, we don't believe the rent limits per se are causing the homeless crisis. It's actually the fact that there's so many in huge increases coming. And regarding the top-ups that you spoke about, um, I'm sure there are people doing top-ups, or we're doing top-ups, but we don't want people to be doing that because we are going above the limits anyway. So those top-ups are no, no longer you know, an issue because of the fact that we are administering limits, you know, we are going above them without any issues. Um, and we do believe that a lot of people, because they were paying top-ups, were afraid to come to us because they felt that, oh, they won't de deal with us now. And that's not the truth. And we are trying to put it out there in the Dublin 15 area that we will talk to anybody, no matter what their issues are. Are they arrears that they have built up? Um, are they paying a top up and they don't want to tell us about it? We'll t discuss anything with them and we will go, with, go r run with it to prevent homelessness. Can I just say, Chair, because yeah, okay. yeah. you're still hundreds behind what the going rate is, unfortunately. I don't agree with having to do this, but I'm just saying you're still hundreds behind. And the only effect of it is that landlords won't take people. Now, we know the law was passed, but they vet people when they get in the queue and they ask them if you're on rent supplement. So all you're doing is landlords won't take people on rent supplement because they can get more rent off other people. So you're putting people in the position of not being able to find a company. I'm saying uh, 250 as, a, as the bottom line. The reality is we are going to the market value. We are going to the asking price. In, in a lot of cases, especially big families or where there's medical issues, because they can be paid under Article 38 anyway. So we're actually going to 1400 and 1300. Uh, so it's not, uh, you know, in general, we are not pushing anybody away and saying that's too much, go away, and then they become homeless. That is not happening. Um, I don't know, you know. And in, in, in terms of the emergency payments to people in emergency accommodation, we have been very supportive in the Dublin 15 area when they come to us, and I believe it's across the board, if they come to us from, say, they've been, their source accommodation was in Dublin 15, and they end up in a hotel in the outskirts, and they have to bring, go, go to and from schools, or they're doing from the, the, their, their community, uh, we are helping out with that, without any issues. Do you give extra for food? Um, th that's debatable. I, d I don't think so. Okay. I don't, and we haven't done that. But, but we, are giving, we are giving it for travel. Yeah. But you'd accept people are paying a lot more on food if um, you're homeless and living in a hotel and you can't buy the food there? I'm not sure whether they're paying any more than they normally would. Well, if you can't cook, you'd be, paying, you'd be eating out all yeah, the time. Okay. But they haven't, we haven't had applications for that. No, because there is no payment for it. Yeah. Um, Ms. Faulkner. Just to come back again, Deputy Grant, but yeah, your point in respect of, say, the food, etc., like the exception leads payments, if it's, you know, an unforeseen expense or there's a particular issue, if there's, depending on the number of children somebody could have in the emergency accommodation, um, um, the, the flexibility is there to see whether um, a payment can be made, but as, as Rita is saying at the minute, it, it hasn't kind of arisen. I know you mentioned the Department of Education in relation to the, the transport. Oftentimes the Supplementary Welfare Land Scheme has kind of been the safety net not only for clients of our own department, but maybe where some other government departments 
are not able to, to meet um, issues of concern and particularly you know, if it's individual cases of transport, um, the Department of Education may not have the flexible response, but definitely um, not only in um, the areas that Rita manages, but we have instances of other um, cases where people have been provided with transport costs because that is just uh, an, an exceptional... Do you know how many? Um, I don't have that figure to, to, to hand up. It might see. look it up and send it okay, on to us. If we have Thanks. something on it in that level, yeah. Okay. Um, Deputy, yes, you mentioned in relation to the, the rent reviews. Um, yes, our two subsequent reviews to 2013 and 2010 and 2011, they had found that the rental values had stabilised at or near the maximum rent limits that were in payment at the time. And it did provide scope to the department to make savings. And just, I suppose, to remember that at that time, we were in um, the Troika situation and the Ireland as a whole had to come forward with savings um, and savings, um, yes, approximately 44 million um, euro was cut from the rent supplement budget at that time. But there was scope there because the rent supplement and the market levels had stabilised at or around the rent limits, limits that we had in place. When we came to the review in uh, mid-2013, um, generally what we were trying to do was to benchmark um, our limits at around the 35th percentile of housing stock that's available. Um, at that time, the department invested €7 million Euro because we needed to bring the limits back up to try and maintain that um, limit. But since then, um, the, the market rents have just escalated. It's approximately 10%, etc. The available supply, as I said, is the lowest um, ever. So th there was no question of trying to kind of match them. What we were trying to do was to retain the households that were being supported in the private rented accommodation in their accommodation. So we were no longer kind of market leaders, etc. as I said, we're trying to um, retain people in the accommodation. And um, the targeted response, as I say, has assisted an extra kind of 8,000 people, and we are looking at spending about 24 million um, euro um, on that um, support this year. Um, Deputy Harty, um, yes, the, the rent deposit. Um, um, again, um, it depends on the individual um, circumstances of the case. In Dublin, with, um, as I say, the Dublin Regional Homeless Executive are working through um, the NGOs, and these are the paid advocates by the state, the likes of Focus Ireland, etc. They've contracts with the Dublin Regional <coughs> Homeless Executive um, to source and support people trying to access accommodation. And that mechanism is working very easily, I suppose, in terms of putting um, the rent deposit and the rent in advance in place in particular cases of need. But it's also with a kind of a whole pool of supports um, around the, the, the client. Um, how easy it is in various parts of the country, um, I wouldn't actually probably have knowledge of that. Um, but again, we will be asking our community welfare staff to try and support people um, as much as possible um, if that is an issue. But like Deputy Function, I will take that matter up um, with my divisional managers just to encourage them in terms of the engagement um, with our clients um, to try and make the, the mechanism as, as easy as, as possible. But again, Deputy, if you have particular instances that you can bring to my attention, I, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just remind colleagues, we're resuming at two o'clock and I have a number of others, so if you could keep the questions as directly as possible and we'll try and finish up so as we can continue at two. Uh, Deputy Ryan. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Ms Falcon and your team for your assistance in our work. Um, threshold, we're in just ahead of you, and basically they come up with a range of administrative reform measures uh, which they say would cost little but would increase the confidence of landlords in the RS scheme. Now, you're going to flick through them. I don't want necessarily an answer on these now, but I would appreciate if you could come back to us in terms of you know, uh, provide for the automatic payment of uh, rent supplement directly to landlords, ensure that RS is paid in advance rather than in arrears, introduce a pre approval mechanism for RS claimants who have been assessed by the local authorities, review the documentation requirements for RS and provide for direct submission of confidential documents by landlords to community welfare staff. 
restore the face-to-face -face applications facility and local social welfare officers, ensure that eligible RS recipients are afforded an exceptional needs payments where they require a sum of money for a security deposit, ensure that RS claimants are given at least 28 days notice of the suspension or termination of RS payments, and place greater reliance on the local review process in respect of RS decisions, afford priority to appeals relating to RS claims, and assure that RS continues to be paid while an appeal is pending. So the range of things there we would like a direct response on, if you could. Not necessarily today. Uh, Deputy Moran. I'd like to echo exactly what I suppose when we were discussing the programme of government, there was 15 independent TDs in the room. No different than what's here today have all raised the same questions that have been put to you today. It seems to me that what you're talking about and the, the, the advice you're giving us here today, that these things are in place, they're actually not. You take right around the country that my colleagues are talking about here, uh, but deposits from, social, from the community welfare, they're not there. I could give you a list of people that have been with community welfare officers, been sent to hospital, been sent back to the local target, been sent and they finished at St Vincent de Paul trying to help them. And it's wrong for us to go over here today thinking that that is the case. The top-up payments, and it is true, if you say you're going to the top-up payment client, they are told they're fraud, they are told they're breaking the law, and the landlord in the finish, gets out. I don't want you in the place because if the work gets back to the local authority or gets back to yourselves. Can I say to you in relation to the flooding, uh, something that I'm very familiar with in my own constituency, and in terms of how people can access money when they're flooded, is almost a joke. The way the paperwork, the questions they're asked, the stuff that's put to them, it's unfair. If you have an area that's uh, flooded, that's, uh, that is floodable, and the local authorities or the government are putting in special, let's be the flood defence, there should be a mechanism found that if it happens again, when we know these areas are prone to flood, there should be an X amount of money put to those people without any delay. This idea of dragging it and dragging it and dragging it out and the effect it has on the family and fixing it, and we all talk about mental illness, it drives people over the edge. It drives people, and then, then people become uh, frustrated with the system. As regards to, as I said, the social, uh, community welfare officer, I don't think there's any money available. Right, you talk an awful lot today is about Dublin and Dublin 4. Homelessness is outside of Dublin. It's not just in the same areas. It's quite, quite large in other areas throughout the country, and I think it's something that we should look at. Thank you very much. Deputy Durkin. Chairman, and uh, delighted to, to see my uh, uh, friends from the Department of Social Welfare before the committee and thank them for their work. Uh, I think there are a couple of things that, that need to be addressed. I think, first of all, I, I, and we've talked about this many times, uh, the Department of Social Welfare was an emergency housing support. It wasn't a housing body, and it should never become a housing body, <coughs> to my mind. And a former minister in that area, Mary Cotton, brought that to the attention of the House of the Rockers quite a few years ago. So what became an emergency support is now an ongoing support and it's, it's ill, it, the, the Department of Social Welfare shouldn't be doing that at all, that falls to another department. However, the points raised by a number of people are valid. First of all, in, in terms of, uh, of upfront payments, one month, uh, one month rent in advance and uh, um, exceptional needs payment for the person about to uh, rent a house uh, on, on, on rent support that, uh, and on HAP and on HAP, uh, is, is, is difficult enough to access in some cases. It's, it, to, for want of a better description, it's patchy. In some cases, depending on who's dealing with it, it's, it's, it works well. In other cases, it doesn't, and you might well be waiting for some considerable time, but the, there is discretion there. I know that. It doesn't always apply. The other part is the, the, the top-up for HAP. Uh, HAP was never intended to have a top-up. In actual fact, HAP was supposed to be the, the answer to bringing it back into the responsibility of the local authorities. And if we have a system whereby the tenant is supposed to pay a top-up on top of that, again, uh, no pun intended, uh, I, I, it seems to me to, be def to defeat the whole purpose of the exercise. And the question is, that arises is, at what stage do we say, well, we, we, we cannot support the increase any longer because we then contribute to inflation in the market. The other point is the degree to which exceptional needs payments have increased or decreased the number of payments uh, over the last uh, two or three years. I'd, 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 like, I'd like that in, uh, particular information. The other question is the obvious one. Is the total number of families now uh, reliant on uh, rent support 
uh, or uh, support through HAP or through uh, one of the various supports, uh, whether it be for rent support, RAS or whatever. The total number of families now currently relying for their housing needs on that support. That's to give us an idea of the, the, of the extent to which we need to address. The exceptional needs payments I've, I've covered, the appeal system. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in relation to a where a case has been determined, the appeal system is patchy as well and takes some considerable time to, to, to uh, activate and to get a result from it. Uh, and that, uh, that re relates to a household that can have, for example, uh, be reliant on rent support, maybe be also reliant on, on carer's allowance or whatever the case may be, uh, and if, if for it, one reason or another a payment is stopped, it takes quite a while and causes a great deal of hardship before the person can uh, re-access uh, uh, the, 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 the support system. Um, I think... Uh, Yes. Uh, the, the last point I want to make is, is in, uh, in relation to procedures. The procedures. I, the, the, the system was working quite well there for a while, and the, depending on the individuals who dealt with the cases where the rent had increased within reason, and uh, that it was found necessary to, to uh, increase on foot of, of documentary evidence. I see a number of cases now where uh, that whole, that form that I dread, the one with 29 or 30 or 40 pages on supplementary welfare application form, when I see one of those coming to me, especially if I see five or six coming in the one day, I, 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 get, I get chill blades, uh, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and I, would, I, would, I, would, I would ask that maybe a simplified system would speed up the system, cost less to the department, less time in assessment and all that kind of thing, because every time I see a voluminous application form, I know straight away that there, therein lies a huge input in terms of labour in assessing it. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Ms Faulkner, just before you reply, um, because an, a considerable number of issues were raised and time is somewhat against us, Deputy Ryan uh, set out a series of questions, and if you haven't got that, we can for forward you the details of that. If you could respond to that um, through correspondence, that would be very useful from the committee's point of view. And to add to it, and you don't have to answer it now, but you can in correspondence, uh, the point being made by Threshold is if two, two, and this is to level the playing field, not to give advantage to one group over another, but if two prospective tenants turn up to a landlord and one has cash in hand to pay the deposit and the first month's rent, and the other is dependent on some sort of state support, from the landlord's point of view, you're not sure when, when you'll come into payment. You probably have to get a tax clearance certificate before you're eligible. You have to get an energy rating certificate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you're not sure what the rate of, of the assistance, depending on which of the state support programs it is, whether it's rent supplement or HAP or RAS or whatever. So from the landlord's point of view, the person who's arriving that's not dependent on state support seems to ha present a better and an easier and a quicker option. And the question I would pose to you, as from the point of view that uh, as a department you have an overarching uh, control over some of this, is what proposals or recommendations would you come up with that would level that playing field? In other words, that when the landlord looks at the two options, they're of equal value, that they're, you know, they're not looking at a lot more uh, paperwork and administrative purpose, um, administrative effort to claim one versus the other. And if you can't answer it here, you might in the correspondence that's uh, coming back to the committee in relation to Deputy Ryan's. Um, and if you'd like to address the other issues that were raised, thank okay. you. Um, well, thank you, Deputy Ryan. Yes, we, we will um, look at the, the transcript from the threshold and the different questions, and um, we will answer them. Um, Deputy Moran, in relation to um, Again, I've, I've noted the comments, as I have from the different deputies, of the apparent um, um, misalignment, I suppose, of the experience in, that your constituents are having on the ground in relation to um, deposits, etc. And we will we will examine that um, in relation to the the, the flooding. Um, uh, the, the humanitarian assistance scheme that's operated by the Department of Social Protection is kind of meeting people's immediate needs and kind of the first stage is emergency income support. And yes, the staff are generally on the ground providing um, money to, you know, essential clothing or personal items or, um, you know, hiring dehumidifiers, etc. for the emergency stage. And generally those payments would be around 100 to 
500 euro. Um, and then stage two and stage three, that's when it kind of gets into the more formal um, assessment in relation to, say, replacement of white goods or furniture and other essential household items. And then stage three, it's kind of the works that are required when um, the houses have dried out, you know, in relation to plastering, dry lying, relaying of floors, etc. And we're still in that in that process with a lot of households um, around the country. Um, but to date, as I said in my statement, but 540 households have been assisted, um, and payments have been made of 1.18 million. And the department has um, legal right now that. When flooding happens, we don't have to go to government to seek approval. We have permission to spend up to 10 million as required in relation to kind of all of these various needs. Now, there's a lot of other issues in relation to flood barriers, or etc., that would be the responsibility of, say, the Office of Public Works and the local authorities. Um, but perhaps we might engage just if there's issues around um, the humanitarian aid scheme that, from your first hand experience, that we can. Um, try and be a little bit better, maybe prepared for the, for the next time. But I am kind of satisfied that we have the feet on the ground, our staff are engaging with the local authorities, with the emergency, you know, with the guards and the fire personnel, etc., um, in this in this space. Um, um, yes, Deputy Durkin, um, the, 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 the various um, elements then in relation to um, I would agree, you know, social welfare and income support, we were should never have been in this whole um, housing support because what in effect happened, we had nearly 90,000 people in receipt of rent supplement and the local authorities, you know, didn't regard them as being their responsibility or on their books or having to try and find a, a housing solution for them. Um, and this is why the... the Rental Accommodation Scheme and the HAP are, are very important um, initiatives in this place. Um, um, to date, in relation to the exceptional needs payments, um, I'm sorry, you know, the, the rent supplement, the RAS and HAP, um, there's 100,000 people being supported um, under those three measures at a cost of about 450 million euro on, on a yearly basis, which is a significant um, investment in relation to that. Um, the ENPs, um, yes, expenditure has been um, decreasing um, over the years, but again, we inherited a, a mechanism where you um, you'd staff operating that had been in eight different health board areas, and depending on the kind of the nature of instructions, etc., there was huge inconsistencies. What we tried to bring is a level of consistency across the country, so that if somebody applies for exceptional needs payment in Boncrana, New Ross, or Kildare, that they can um, generally pr be provided with the, the same level of service. And there was a lot of payments that were being made that were not exceptional or you know, unforeseen, and we were trying to bring a level of, of consistency to those. Um, but, um, for example, like there is still, you know, the payments seem to have stabilised at or around th uh, 30 million um, per annum. But it's a demand-led scheme, and if the demand increases for whatever reason, um, we will um, ensure that the, the proper supports are provided. Um, um, Yes, the appeals uh, mechanism, it's generally at a local level in terms of the appeals that if a community welfare officer has made a decision and if the person is not happy with it, the area manager, people like um, Rita or Carl, would review um, in the first instance um, the, the, the payments made. It would always be somebody um, different to the original person that has made the decision and would, would review it. The form... Um, Yes, it, it's, it's, it is probably one of our more complicated ones. Again, as I said, the, you know, the third party intervention with the landlords. One of the, the big um, supports in terms of and um, efficiencies that have been gained with the establishment of our intro centres is that our community welfare staff, service staff have access to our central IT system, which is called the, the BOMI. And so the amount of data that they now have available to them in terms of the means of clients, etc., has um, assisted so that now, for example, in terms of our processing of, of the, the, the primary social welfare payments is down from about three weeks to about three days. And the data that the staff have available to them um, is ass assisting them. Are we there yet in terms of some of the SWA schemes? No, but um, that's kind of our next stage in terms of trying to uh, improve the efficiencies in the in the processing of those particular um, claims. And um, Chair, um, 
yes, the various proposals in terms of, you know, our clients that are competing, um, it, it is a challenge. Um, and um, what I will do is, um, Deputy, um, we will consider those issues and come back with um, a note on the issues to the, the committee. Is it possible that a grant could be given out to people? You talk about people in vulnerable areas that can lift their sockets off the ground. We all know where a socket is in a house, such as tiling the house inside that if water comes in, it goes out. Is it, can the e look at a grant to make available? It will save millions going down the road for, uh, uh, without a claims going in every year, every three years, or every nine years. That's something you should look at. Can I just say, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased with what we're currently doing, um, we've hired um, loss adjusters um, to assist us with the stage three um, kind of refurbishments, but what we've also asked the loss adjuster is to give advice to the householder on, on the simple measures like that. Um, hiring up the sockets, replacing wooden floors with tiles, etc. And that is in place, and those stage three payments that we're making are covering and including any type of preventative measures like that. Um, and they are being made. No, yeah. that's, that's, sorry, that's okay for, the, for you to say, I appreciate that, but if you take some of the, like, at loan this time, we saved 120 houses. Yes. It, there's no to say that if it happened again, the flood barriers are going, they haven't got any grant. I'm talking about those houses that are vulnerable at this stage. Okay. It was an emergency in November. It still is an emergency today. Is there a grant, of, or could a grant be made available to those people to start doing the works now? on those houses, preventing something disaster like that ever happen again, and I hope it doesn't, but I'm only saying sure. for that reason. That's sure. all. Thank you. Um, there is an, an interdepartmental group that's been led by the Office of Public Works looking at this whole area of preventative measures um, at kind of the, the local level, but also kind of at the, at the individual level, and our department are, are represented on that group, and we will absolutely be supportive of whatever kind of instructions come out of that working group. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bogner, and thank you to uh, the, the full team from the Department of Social Protection for attending today, uh, your submission, in it, um, and also uh, the answers to the questions were enlightening, and you have a number of written answers that you'll forward on to the committee. We appreciate uh, your attendance today. Uh, we now suspend until 2 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you very much.